order. Um, the committee is meeting today to receive testimony on the fiscal year 2023 budget request of the Department of Interior's Office of Insular Affairs. And the Office of Insular Affairs is responsible for coordinating federal policies in the insular areas uh, of American Samoa, Guam, the Northern Marianas, and the United States Virgin Islands. And this hearing is an opportunity for Department of Interior's Office of Insular Affairs to highlight key aspects of its budget request and for territorial governors to outline their needs and priorities for the coming fiscal year, as well as provide an update on their efforts to address challenges in their communities. Under Rule 4, I ask, uh, any oral opening statements of the hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member or their designees. And this will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. And as described in the notice statements, documents, or motions, as in the notice statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at HNRC docs, that's D O C S, at mail.house.gov. HNRC D O C S at mail.house.gov. Members physically present should provide a hard copy for staff to distribute by email. Please note that members are responsible for their own microphones. As with fully in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. Uh, I will now begin with my opening statement. Good morning and uh, welcome to this oversight hearing on the Department of Interior's Office of Insular Affairs fiscal year 2023 budget request. I want to welcome the governors uh, from the insular areas who are joining us remotely. Uh, Governor Brian from the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, Governor Le Leon Guerrero from, uh, the, from Guam and Governor Malga of American Samoa. I understand Governor Torres uh, of the Northern Marianas is unable to join us today, but has submitted his testimony for the record. And uh, without objection, that testimony shall be included in the hearing record. Welcome also to Mr. Don, the Budget Director for the Office of Insular Affairs. Uh, and it is uh, disappointing. The Deputy Assistant Secretary Nakoya is not here to defend his office's budget. I know that for Governor Leon Guerrero and Governor Malga, as I said earlier, this is the middle of the night for them, which shows the importance they place on President Biden's budget priorities for insular affairs. And lastly, welcome to Mr. Soblik of the American Foreign Policy Council. Historically, the economies of the insular areas have lacked the rest of the United States, often relying on federal funding to meet basic human needs. Our economies rely Our economies rely on tourism, which has been particularly hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. And although we may be seeing tourism beginning slowly to tick up, to arrive as the pandemic uh, wanes, hopefully that trend continues. And hopefully in a year, two years time, we would have an economy that's a tourism industry, a hospitality industry that's once again improved, much more improved than we had in the past two years. Uh, nevertheless, serious damage has been done. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis, the gross domestic product of Guam decreased 11.9% in 2020 because of COVID. We do not yet have the 2020 GDP data for the Marianas. The Bureau of Economic Analysis said they're still waiting on government financial data from the government, Commonwealth government. But we know the Mariana's economy faced multiple challenges even prior to the pandemic as a result of Super Typhoon U2 in 2018. 
And whereas Mariana's GDP fell 19.3% in 2018 and another 11.2% in 2019, with sharp declines in tourist spending, casino gambling revenue, and private fixed investment. The U.S. Virgin Islands and American Samoa face similarly extreme economic challenges. And with the, without the financial help Congress has provided, it is hard to imagine how any of the insular areas would have made it through the pandemic. The American Rescue Plan Act provided the Marianas, for instance, with 160 million to keep teachers paid and students in school. 25 million went to nutrition assistance for families who lost income. And 482 million went directly to the Commonwealth Treasury for government operations and other purposes. Not to mention the continuation of unemployment assistance, economic impact payments to individuals, and the money that was an assistance that was necessary for uh, for health uh, from vaccines to testing. And of course, we are disappointed the president's Build Back Better agenda was not funded. Uh, he would have provided nearly $1 billion for insular infrastructure that would have gone a long way to upgrading our hospitals. You know, whether it's at Guam Memorial Hospital, it's the Commonwealth Health Center, uh, or uh, the LBJ Hospital in America. Someone, of course, uh, in health infrastructure also to U.S. standards for also the U.S. Virgin Islands. But the president's fiscal year 23 budget continues to pursue many of the Build Back Better goals in the insular areas. There is increased funding for the Coral Reef Initiative, which addresses the effects of climate change and protects native ecosystems for further damage. And the president has proposed $15.5 million for the Energizing Insular Communities Program an increase of $4.5 million over the fiscal year 22 enacted level. This program to develop renewable energy and improve grid efficiency can both reduce carbon emissions in the insular areas and reduce energy costs for the people I represent. Given how important it is to all Americans right now to cut energy costs, I hope Mr. Don will tell us what the Office of Insular Affairs is doing to implement Public Law 113-235 which authorizes the energizing insular communities program with the specific goal of lowering the cost of electricity. This is not the first time that I have asked this question of the Department of Interior. And so, but again, I want to welcome all our witnesses today. We look forward to receiving your testimony. And um, I'd now like to uh, recognize the vice ranking member for uh, any statement. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez, come on, please. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses that are here with us today. Um, we intend to analyze the President's fiscal year 2023 budget request for insular affairs. And the Office of Info Insular Affairs within the Department of Interior is responsible for carrying out responsibilities for the territories of American Samoa, the Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. In addition to providing assistance to these territories, the Office of Insular Affairs is charged with, the, with overseeing federal assistance under the Compact of Free Association, which the United States has signed with the three independent freely associated states, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau. Given the geographic location and size, of the U.S. territories and freely associated states each face many unique challenges. This can be in the form of economic, health care, quality, infrastructure, and many others. My hope is that we can work together to address each <coughs> island prior priorities in an efficient way that is beneficial to the taxpayers. The President Fiscal Budget 2023 request for the office is $125 million for current discretionary appropriations and $610 million for permanent funding. This represents an increase of nearly $14 million for the fiscal year 2020 level, 2022 level. Half of this request increase, $7 million, is attributed to the energizing the territories line item with an emphasis, emphasis on renewable energy and grid infrastructure. As I have stated before, it is crucial that we help territories diversify their energy sources to address high electricity costs that hamper economic growth. We must increase our use of renewables, and I have introduced legislation like the Offshore Wind for Territories Act to achieve this. 
But Rigo has also published a 1.5 billion RFP for renewables and storage. However, I also support an all of the evolved energy approach. I am a strong proponent of upgrading the existing plants to liquefy natural gas, which is a cleaner and more reliable and stable. Reliability is a key to all of our insular areas, especially to support and expand key industries. Affordability is also a critical important issue, and the individual needs of each island must be considered before we start mandating renewable energy projects in the territories. With a debt of $23 trillion, we must be diligent with the expenditures while living up to commitments we already have made. I do want to turn to a topic that I believe is very important, relevant, uh, very relevant to today's hearing, given the department uh, provides funding to the freely associated states and is engaged in the management of the compact trust funds. In recent years, China has continued using military and economic coercion to bully its neighbors in the Indo-Pacific region, advance unlawful maritime claims threaten maritime shipping lanes, and destabilize territory along the uh, periphery of the People's Republic of China. While China's influence in the Indo-Pacific region is growing, its engagement has been relatively limited in the freely associated states as a whole, primarily limited uh, due to the U.S. security and economic presence uh, and to the China's lack of diplomatic relations with the Martian Islands and Palau. Among the freely associated states, China's engagement is greatest, greatest in Micronesia, where it is a major provider of economic assistance, assistance and investment. Recent actions by, the, by China underscore the need for continued attention and compact renewal with the freely associated states before they expire in 2023 and 2024, as they could have wide-ranging uh, ranging impacts on the U.S. influence and control in the Indo-Pacific region. Congress should also exa uh, examine, examine uh, compact trust funds uh, as their envisioned health to provide <coughs> long-term sufficiency uh, for the F FSM and the RMI has not been realized. I want to thank the witnesses, and I look forward to their testimony today, and I yield back. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Gonzalez Colon. Uh, now I will turn over, turn to our witnesses, but before introducing them, I will remind not administration witnesses that they're encouraged to participate in the witness diversity survey created by the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Witnesses may refer to their hearing invitation materials for further information. Um, let me now introduce the, our witnesses. Um, the Honorable Albert Bryan, Jr., the Governor of the United States Virgin Islands. Uh, welcome, Governor Bryan. The Honorable Lou Leon Guerrero, Governor of Guam. Uh, welcome, Governor Leon Guerrero. The Honorable Lemano Pelletti Cielega Molga. I hope I got that right, Governor of American Samoa. Mr. Jonathan Don, the Director of Budget, Department of Interior's Office of Insular Affairs. And uh, Mr. Michael Sobolik, a fellow in Indo-Pacific Studies, uh, American Foreign Policy Council. Let me remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will begin and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I recommend that members and witnesses joining remotely pin the timer so it remains visible. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will also allow the entire panel to testify before questioning the witnesses. Um, the chair now recognizes um, the Honorable uh, Lourdes Leon Guerrero uh, from Guam. Um, Governor Guerrero, you may, you have five minutes, please. Uh, for the day. Uh, Congressman uh, Kalili, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the fiscal year 
2023 budget request of the Department of Interior's Office of Insular Affairs. After reviewing the provisions of the OIA's fiscal year 2023 budget request, my office makes the following recommendations. Before COVID-19, Guam had limited healthcare capacity and at the height of the pandemic, resources were stretched even thinner. The pandemic made it clear that now is the time to build a new hospital. The Guam Memorial Hospital is in dire need of a new facility. It is on the verge of infrastructural failure due to its age, environmental exposure, and lack of financial resources over the years for critical repairs. In 2019, an assessment conducted by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers funded by the Department of Interior's OIA, recommended the replacement of the hospital's facilities to ensure accreditation compliance at an estimated cost of $743 million. As a nurse by profession, I understand the urgency of prioritizing our healthcare systems and facilities. Additionally, as Guam holds the highest military enlist enlistment rate per capita in the nation and is home to more than 8,000 veterans, we plan to install a veteran-dedicated wing within the new hospital. Guam does not have a veteran affairs hospital, and the nearest one is more than 3,000 miles away. So this is a necessary step to ensure that our service members receive critical health care services. Last year, the House of Representatives passed the Build Back Better Act, which included an allocation of at least $347 million for Guam's new public hospital. While the act has not passed the Senate, I request that Guam's allocation for capital improvement funding be increased in order to provide the financial backing necessary to help fund this project. I also request that Congress return excess federal land to the government of Guam for the medical complex. Proposed lots will be sent to the committee. Land is very precious to our people and Guam, is only, Guam only has 212 square miles and the federal government controls one third. This is why I have been intent on securing the return of as much land as possible for local use. In addition to the construction of a new hospital, Guam continues to pursue ways to improve the efficiency and quality of its healthcare system. We are looking to establish the island's first ever health information system to create an integrated healthcare network among both public and private healthcare facilities. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the importance of having timely access to patient health records when being treated for life-threatening conditions. The government of Guam requests for a greater increase in compact impact discretionary funds. While Guam remains supportive of the US FAS relationship, it is important to recognize and mitigate the adverse effects that the current stipulations of the COFA agreements continue to have on Guam's infrastructure and social services. In 2020, the U.S. Government Accountability Office released a report entitled Compacts of Free Association, Population in U.S. Areas Have Grown, with varying reported effects, which noted that Guam reported $1.2 in total impact over the last 14 years. The report also stated that Guam was only provided $259.7 million in compact impact grants to defray costs due to the residents of compact migrants. This means that Guam only received about 20% of the funds owed to it by the federal government. Thank you very much, Congressman uh, Sablon, for the opportunity to make our case. Sidhu Usmasit. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Guerrero. Um, perfect timing, too. Um, let me now turn to um, the governor from American Samoa, uh, Governor Malga. Um, uh, you have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Talofan greeting from American Samoa. I want to thank you, uh, Vice Chair Saplang, 
distinguished members of the committee for the opportunity to comment on the fiscal year 23 budget for the Office of Insular Affairs. I would like to also recognize our Congresswoman, uh, High Chief Uifatali Redawagin, for her work, not only for our territory, but all of the uh, U.S. and our nation. We have learned much from fiscal year 22 and still faces enormous challenges as we plan for fiscal year 23. I would like to share with you some key important challenges facing American Samoa. But I would be remiss if I don't thank you all, especially the Secretary of uh, Interior, DOI, for the ongoing effort to improve the lives of uh, U.S. territories. I will start just like the uh, Governor of Guam, the American Samoa Hospital, Lyndon Payne Johnson Medical Center, LPJ, as we call Facility was built in 1968, lacks the fiscal capacity to appropriately respond to a host of medical conditions. LPJ is not uh, now diverting its limited operating resources to address the pandemic, causing the potential shortages of medication, essentially health supplies, equipment, doctors, nurses, workforce, and overcrowded old hospital building. FEMA, in, in, uh, as usual, coming our support of, uh, during the COVID-19. In uh, 2019, the Department of Interior conducted an assessment of LPJ facility and concluded that the hospital was not in compliance with the current seismic and weighing requirements and suggested that rather than repair or retrofit the current facility, construction of a new hospital will be more advantageous. The Army Corps of Engineers also conducted a review and determined that LPJ facility is in a state of failure due to age and environmental exposure. Corps of Engineers noted that extensive repair or replacement of the facility is required to ensure compliance with hospital accreditations, standards, and to protect the life, health, and safety of staffs, patients, and visitors. LPG facilities also does not have the equipment or personnel to treat cancer, hip, knee replacements, heart, and other surgeries and maladies that afflict people of American Samoa. For those medical conditions, patients are flowing off island via medical transport to New Zealand for treatment. People of American Samoa need better access to care without flight to another country for life-saving procedures and care. The administration budget requests total 9.1 million for hospital operations, and we are thankful for the request funded, requested funded. However, we respectfully request a major increase in our operating revenues to help provide resources needed to respond to ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, at the same time continue to provide the care and treatment for critical medical conditions. And furthermore, skip pillar. LPJ, as, as was mentioned, uh, will need a lot of uh, monetary support to build the new hospital that we have already started. In order to control the spread of COVID-19, ASG shut down its borders in November of 2020. We were one of the few places in the world without any COVID-19 cases. But that status changed in September of 21 when we began to bring people back to the island. The first positive case was resident returning to American Samoa. Cases now total over 5,800 5, with the uh, 109 active cases and 30 reported deaths. ASG work with limited resources to build quarantine facilities and to retrofit its own hospital in preparation for COVID-19. Our vaccination efforts have reached more than 80% of our population, and we continue our quarantine operations as we bring back more flights to our island. COVID-19 has reduced our local revenues because of declined domestic and international travel, leading to the closure of businesses and job lost. All of these factors make increased federal dollars more important than ever. Good news is, however, 
shipyard has uh, done a lot of improvement and a lot of support from DOI. Uh, shipyard now can do cutters or hire of the U.S. Coast Guard. One of the key important uh, aspects of uh, islanders, U.S. territories, is the climate change. Natural disasters have become more prevalent in the Pacific region, and we have experienced damages to our critical infrastructures as a result of sea level rise, severe flood, co coastal erosion, and landslides are part of our problems in American Samoa and very sure all the territories. American Samoa is exceptionally vulnerable to the sea level rise because significant portion of the islands, villages, and infrastructure, including all critical ports, are located along strips of the coastal land. Situation worsened by ongoing subsistence since the 2009 earthquake. Tsunami resulting in shifting of tectonic plates. American Samoa is subsiding at a rate roughly six times the global sea level rise average and experiencing a relative sea rise of 9.8 inches in 11 years from September 2009 to January 2020. We need to respond to climate change with a matter of urgency by investing in mitigation projects that will reduce the risk of damages to existing infrastructure, ensure community resilience in the aftermath of all hazard disasters. Untimely events of extreme weather and disasters are unavoidable and expensive. The rebuild is time consuming, especially with limited, readily available resources and project related subject matter expertise on the island. Now, withstanding our mutual interest in the benefit of the US, American Samoa remains a disadvantaged and underserved population. We believe this is due to our remoteness and our small voice by purpose. Here as a governor can of we, territory. Can we, close, can we get to close this, governor, please? Yeah, two and a half minutes over, but go ahead. Please close it uh, when you respectfully, yeah, thank you. In closing, as I mentioned, um, with the uh, those are the issues that I now, I now have in American Samoa, and I will uh, submit our full report on, on, on paper uh, for, uh, for the committee to review. Much, as I mentioned, uh, the key areas are climate change, hospital, and of course the presence of the Chinese in the Pacific are the three critical issues that American Samoa are addressing here. I know I'm out of time, and I thank you, uh, Mr. Saplan, and the committee uh, for the opportunity to address the uh, fiscal year 23 budget review uh, this morning. Thank yeah, you very th much. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Walga. Thank you very much. Um, let, now, um, let me, uh, uh, Governor Brian of the United States Virgin Islands. Uh, Governor, you have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Um, we're having a hard time hearing you, Governor. Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, it's not. You're not muted, but I, something with your speaker. What about No. Very I'm not sure if that's your end no, or our end, but I think it may be at your end, Governor uh, Brian. What about now? Are you hearing me? My... Right now? Think of settings on. Um, that's what she did. Oh. Can you hear me now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, awesome. nine, ten. Can you yes, hear me now? Yes, sir. 
Okay, great. And the timer starts now also. Thank you. On behalf of the people of the United States Virgin Islands, I wish to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you to today to discuss the state of the United States Virgin Islands, our territory's priorities for 2022, and the President's fiscal year 2023 budget requests. We are grateful to the committed and to the committee and to your colleagues in Congress for your concern and your support in our efforts to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 pandemic, which struck and paralyzed our tourism economy just as it, it was just as it was emerging from the catastrophic hurricanes that struck in September of 2017. With the help of Congress and this committee, we have endured the worst of the pandemic. And our tourism sector, nearly one third of our economy, is beginning to thrive again. Our revenues are up and our debt burden is down, thanks to a recent major bond issue. We are laying the foundation for a stable, sustainable prosperity for the people of the Virgin Islands. But there is still much work to be done. Even before the pandemic and the hurricanes, the Virgin Islands face unique challenges not encountered on the mainland. Some are the result of factors beyond the control of the federal government, such as geographic distance and isolation, lack of natural resources, and the need to replicate infrastructure and services across three separate landscapes. But some challenges we face result from federal policies which are within the power of Congress to change. And I will focus my comments today on the most and more pressing issues we face and how Congress can assist us in addressing them. My written statement addresses several specific needs and, and policy issues in detail. In my short time before you today, I want to focus on a broader principle that the United States Virgin Islands is an integral part of the United States of America. Its people are American citizens entitled to the same rights, privileges, and benefits as American citizens who reside in Hawaii or Arizona or Arkansas. As President Biden said last year, there can be no second class citizens in the United States of America. I ask you to be guided by this principle when you legislate for the Virgin Islands and the other territories. For too long, the Americans living in the insular areas have been treated as foreign or other as something less than American citizens living on mainland soil. To cite just a few examples, a disabled American who lives in a state is entitled to receive supplemental security income without regard to geographic location or what taxes are paid. If she moves to the Virgin Islands, she loses that right. Medicaid funding for the territory has for decades been systematically lagged uh, lag for in behind in funding for the poorest of the states. And under the tax laws, investments made by U.S. investors in the Virgin Islands are treated as investments in a foreign country. This means that tax rules designed to disincentivize American investments in foreign tax havens like the Cayman Islands or Isle of Jersey apply equally to investments in the American territories. I ask this committee today to change that. Even if the construction constitution permits the federal government to treat American citizens living on American land unequally simply because that land is a territory, there is no question that Congress has the authority and I would argue the moral obligation to treat all Americans the same. Citizenship is not geographic. With that principle in mind, let me speak briefly about the specific challenges our territory faces and continue to face. First, Although our economy is recovering, we continue to cope with financial challenges that began with the hurricanes and were exacerbated by the pandemic. Significant amounts of appropriated disaster funds remain inaccessible to the territory because of unrealistic local match requirements imposed by federal agencies. By statute, Congress permits agencies to waive any requirement for matching funds otherwise required by law to be provided by a territory. In practice, however, that authority is never used. I respectfully urge the committee to amend 48 USC to require agencies to exercise that authority for the territories. Second, federal tax policy has imposed significant constraints on our ability to attract badly needed private investment. The tax code treats US investments in its own territories as foreign investments, making them subject to the so-called guilty tax which is designed to discourage American companies from stashing profits in foreign tax havens, like Ireland. The U.S. Virgin Island is neither foreign nor a tax haven. It's a U.S. territory whose tax laws are promulgated by Congress. Treating us like a foreign country makes no sense, 
and is contrary to decades of congressional policies intended to encourage U.S. investment in the territories. I respectfully ask for your support in reversing this inequitable treatment. Third, the economic problems resulting from the hurricanes and COVID-19 have now been further aggravated by the Environmental Protection Agency decision last May to shut down the Lime Tree Bay refinery on St. Croix, costing us 800 jobs and 633 million in reduced GDP. We all share the EPA's concern with the safety of our, of our, of our islands and the unique importance of the refinery to the economic and financial well-being of the Virgin Islands community. Environmental justice is a hollow victory without economic opportunity. I therefore ask for Congress assistance in working with the territory and the EPA to ensure that the refinery is permitted to responsibly and safely reopen. Fourth, we are urgently seeking restoration of an adequate funding for the territory's highways. That funding was cut to the bone in 2012 and has never been fully restored. With predictability, deleterious effects on our roads, yet another example of Americans receiving poorer treatment. The four small territory for funding was cut, was unfair, and all of these are uniquely pressing transportation needs. Fifth and finally, the Supreme Court's decision in Valle Madero, handed down April 21, 2022, held that the American citizens on, of the territories cannot look to the Constitution of the United States for equal protection under the law in making claims for supplemental security income like their countrymen residing on the mainland. Instead, the court has directed us to appeal to the Congress. So we now ask you, grant our citizens of the territories paratory with their fellow Americans and guarantee that Virgin Islanders and all those who reside in territories can access SSI benefits. All of these points frame the territory's reception of the president's 2023 budget. We are greatly pleased with the president's proposal to provide parity to the territories in the supplemental security income program. Eliminate our, the arbitrarily low federal matching rates for Medicaid in the territories, eliminate Medicaid funding caps for the territories and provide the option to transition from the current block grants to SNAP. My written statement describes all of these in full. I thank you for allowing me this time to testify before you and, and along with my fellow governors, hope that you seek uh, solutions to these decades old problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, actually, we're here we're hearing about the problems you are going through in, in your jurisdictions and trying to work with you also in getting so many of these things. So much work remains. But thank you, Governor Brian, for your testimony. Uh, now, let me uh, ask Mr. Don. Mr. Don, uh, uh, sir, uh, you have uh, five minutes, please. Thank you. Chair Sablon, Ranking Member Cologne, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the President's fiscal year 2023 budget request for the Office of Insular Affairs. OAA is responsible for administering the federal government's relationship with the territories of American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marian Islands, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. OAA also administers financial assistance provided to the freely associated states the Federated States of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau under the Compacts of Free Association. The proposed fiscal year 23 budget totals 736 million, an increase of 7 million over the 22 enacted appropriation. Approximately half of this increase is attributable to estimated increases for permanent appropriations. The request for current appropriations for 23 is 126 million. This amount is an increase of Four million from the 22 enacted appropriation included in this current appropriation request are 98 million in discretionary funding and 27.7 million in mandatory funding. The president's 2023 budget request continues support for cohort OIA programs within the assistance to territories appropriation. These programs provide the territories with much needed funding for the delivery of public services such as health and education, infrastructure investments, and technical assistance. In addition to these important activities, the 23 budget also seeks to advance the energy independence of the insular areas by providing 15.5 million to the Energizing Insular Communities Program. The administration is committed to energy projects which support a clean energy future for the insular areas through investments in both clean and renewable development. U.S. territories and freely associated states are also on the front lines of climate change. 
facing rising sea levels and increasingly, increasingly disruptive weather events, these island communities require investments in disaster response, recovery, and hazard mitigation, which will help them to adapt and become more resilient and thrive. The President's budget requests assist these communities with technical expertise and investments aimed to fortify their natural resources and adapt their public infrastructure against climate challenges by incorporating nature-based solutions alongside traditional infrastructure investments. OIS technical assistance, energizing insular communities, coral reef and natural resources, capital improvement project, and maintenance assistance programs all contribute to strengthen island communities. The 23 President's budget also fulfills the $20 million commitment made to the Republic of the Marshall Islands for tax and trade compensation with the final $5 million payment requested under the Federal Services Program. For 23, permanent mandatory commitments include an estimated $380 million for fiscal payments to Guam and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Guam is expected to receive $80 million in income tax payments attributable to military and federal personnel stationed in Guam. While the Virgin Islands is expected to collect around $300 million for excise taxes paid to the federal government on rum produced in the Virgin Islands. Permanent mandatory funding also includes $230 million for payments under the Compacts of Free Association with the Republics of the Marshall Islands and the Federated States of Micronesia, annual compact impact funding, and judicial training uh, under the last year of the 23 amended Compact Act. The budget request includes language that demonstrates the administration's support for funding the renewal of our Compact of Free Association relationships with the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau. The administration will request necessary mandatory funding to be appropriated to the Department of State with language calling for continued implementation by the Department of the Interior. The United States remains committed to its longstanding partnerships with the governments and people of the freely associated states as we work together to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, Chairman Sablon and Ranking Member Colon and members of the committee, it's been a pleasure uh, to appear before you to discuss our 23 budget request. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Don. And I thank, I mean, also, I, I think you, this is the first uh, opportunity for you to appear before the committee uh, in your position as director. Uh, do I have that right, Mr. Don? That's correct. Okay, so welcome, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now, Mr. Um, I will turn to our last one, it's Mr. Sobolik. I, did I say that right, Sobolik? You did, sir. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Soblik, and you know, look, we try as much as possible to go through the testimonies of our witnesses before the hearings, and I, I sort of leaned through yours, and and I found a sentence here that really makes a lot of sense that I have been been saying, speaking out loud to many of my colleagues here. And this is a the two paragraphs before your conclusion, sir. You just want the sentence speaking about the freely associated states to saying, if we do not uphold our legal and moral obligations to these nations, we risk more than a diplomatic setback. And this is already becoming obvious in the recent, you know, Solomon Islands uh, uh, situation. Uh, so. Please continue to uh, advocate for those positions because it's much more important. It's very important to, to America itself and, and to, of course, our allies. But you have five minutes, Mr. Sobolik. Please, um, thank you. Vice Chair Sablon, thank you for those comments. I, I'm in full agreement that we are uh, in, in desperate need to get these compacts resolved uh, and for our obligations to be made clear. Uh, Vice Chair. Ranking Member Gonzalez Colon, distinguished members of the committee, it's a privilege for me to appear before you today to discuss the FY23 budget request of the Department of the Interior's Office of Insular Affairs. Of paramount importance to OIA's mission is bolstering America's relations with our territories and the freely associated states. The budget request for OIA includes significant funding for climate resilience, conservation, and clean energy programs. U.S. territories could be exceptional candidates for these initiatives, 
But the Biden administration should take particular care to account for other geopolitical factors that impact OIA's specific responsibilities, namely the rise of the People's Republic of China. The Chinese Communist Party views these island nations through the prism of its broader strategy, leveraging its economic dominance to sideline the United States from the region. From, 20, from 2017 to 2017, Chinese trade with Pacific Island nations grew by a factor of four. China has also poured foreign direct investment into the region as it pulls more and more nations into its global Belt and Road Initiative. Beijing often wields its commercial heft to isolate Taiwan and pick off its alliances. Indeed, the Solomon Islands and Kiribati broke off diplomatic ties with Taipei in 2019 in favor of relations with Beijing. The Solomon Islands more recently, as you, Vice Chair, just mentioned a few seconds ago, entered into an agreement with Beijing that would allow the People's Liberation Army Navy to access its ports. This development has led Washington, Canberra, and others to worry that China may eventually establish a military base in the Southern Pacific. In the Northern Pacific, however, the US has the upper hand. The Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and Palau have freely associated with the United States for decades under agreements called Compacts of Free Association, or COFAs. These nations are not formal American territories, but all rely on Washington for federal assistance and government programs. Washington has also underwritten billions of dollars in economic ass assistance to these island nations since the 1980s in the form of grants and trust funds. Under the COFAs, the United States has an explicit obligation to defend these nations from attack. In return, America retains certain defense facilities in the region that are vital to our national interest. But more important than any one island or facility are America's right of strategic denial and its defense veto. The former authority empowers Washington to deny foreign militaries access to the islands and their territorial waters. The latter constrains the FAS governments themselves from taking actions incompatible with America's defense obligations and authority. In light of the People's Liberation Army's growing capabilities and China's rise, the US government views these islands and the COFAs as one of its greatest strategic advantages against China in the Pacific. But America's haphazard response to the leaked agreement between the Solomon Islands and the PRC suggests that Washington has taken its eye off this critically important region. And to make matters worse, America's economic assistance to freely associated states under the COFA agreements are set to expire in 2023 for the Marshall Islands and for Micronesia, and in 2024 for Palau. Were the COFA assistance to lapse, it would provide an open door for China to approach these island nations with counteroffers. If we do not uphold our legal and moral obligations to these nations, we risk more than a diplomatic setback. We could potentially open the door to Beijing in a critical region that would undermine key tenets of our own free and open Indo-Pacific framework. These atoll nations are vital in the broader great power competition now unfolding between Washington and Beijing. But the COFA negotiations are more than a necessity for our strategy in the Pacific. They are a test of America's trustworthiness as a partner. OIA is to be commended for its explicit commitment to renew these compacts, but much work remains to be done to ensure the strength of these critical relationships thousands of miles away. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Sobolik. And I, I just can't help remembering that there was, it was a joke, but it wasn't really that funny for many of us when he was in the trust territory era, when we say that the United States, uh, the Micronesians have the trust and the United States has the territory. Um, and uh, so uh, thank you. I want to thank all the witnesses uh, for the testimony. I thank the panel for the testimony. And next we will go to 
questions, member questions. I'll remind, I'd like to remind members also that our committee rule 3D imposes a five minute limit on questions and the chair will recognize members for any questions they may ask, um, you know, uh, switching sides from one side to the rest. Uh, let me uh, see, um, Mr. Case was on, was with us uh, earlier, um, I and Mr. Lowenthal, but now I see uh, Mr. Lip. Mr. Lip, you you can jump in and ask and take your five minutes for questions. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair, uh, Chairman. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much to all of our witnesses here today testifying on behalf of the territories you all represent. Um, for me, as you know, this is my second term and I, I have to be honest, it continues to be kind of shocking and really unacceptable outrage that 3.5 million people living in U.S. territories are subject to a, a separate and unequal status quo and denied access to and the full benefit of life-saving federal programs like Medicaid and SSI. Uh, I know we're all very familiar with, you know, Medicaid and, and the critical lifeline it provides for many low-income, most vulnerable communities seeking health care, uh, many, again, to survive and thrive. Uh, but it's an outrage that Medicaid funding to U.S. territories is subject to an arbitrary cap that prevents responding to changing economic conditions or emergency situations like the pandemic. I know for my residents in the 13th district, having access to SSI, you know, the supplemental security income, uh, helps them keep their roof over their heads and food on their tables. And yet residents of the U.S. territories are unfairly excluded from receiving the same benefits. As we all also know, food insecurity in territories have been worsened by impacts of natural disasters, yet SNAP and TANF are only available in certain territories and their funding, again, all just limit, you know, limited. No really rhyme or reason, in my opinion, of why that is continues to be done. Um, so to any of the honorable governors, what would parity, you know, equity and federal funding for Medicaid and SNAP and SSI mean for millions of people who call your communities home? Um, and can any of you speak to the human impact of your residents being denied? I mean, many of you have touched on this in your testimony, but I really think we want to get this in the congressional record and understanding what the human impact is. And again, allowing, again, 3.5 million people being denied these critical programs. So for me in Guam, uh, for Medicaid, uh, we are capped. Uh, right now, there is a temporary um, increase in Medicaid funding, but that's going to expire. And uh, when you cap it, we cap it at you, Congress caps it at 18 million. Well, that's nothing because our uh, access to health care costs about maybe 126 to 130 million. And now we are also um, we are also uh, providing Medicaid uh, services to COFA residents uh, as that is that has been passed. And so that increases the expenses to our island. Um, you know, denying access to health care, I think, is very inhumane. I think it's totally uh, uncivil. Uh, when someone needs health care, they need to have health care. And if we can use monies to prevent diseases, that is even better. But my equity portion uh, recommendation is to lift the cap and to calculate those Medicaid funds based on income per capita, like every other uh, state of the United States. Any um, other governors? Yes, sir. Yes, for, for us, it means families splitting up. I mean, a lot of times we have families that are here and they have to, the, the wife or the husband would move to the states with the child in order to get better care and be able to benefit from those social security benefits. We have 35,000 Medicaid uh, uh, participants in the islands. We only have 87,000 people 
of the incredibly high heart, uh, poverty rate. Uh, it's, it's so impactful. And then just, it's such a small amount of people and it would make such a huge difference in our community uh, for parents raising children with disabilities, especially when they age out um, of regular schools and they need other support systems that those parents can't afford. Uh, in in American Samoa, similar to the uh, the other U.S. territories, were pretty much uh, the necessity of Medicare in in on the island is very important. And like uh, the governor of Virgin of uh, Virgin Island has said, uh, that people are are relocating out of American Samoa to the mainland. Uh, to uh, because of the uh, high cost of uh, Medicare, and for us in American Samoa, Medicaid is kept as well as was mentioned by the uh, governor of Guam, and the cost share is so high uh, that we uh, couldn't even afford the cost share. We don't even use the whole uh, amount that was given to American Samoa because the island for American Samoa, the cost share is so high we can't afford it. Thank you so much. Uh, I yield, Chairman. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and you know, I would also I, I agree. You know, um, it's it's been a long battle to on Medicaid to finally come to a point where members here don't have to start chasing the budget item uh, to get a, a, a level funding or increased amount for Medicaid. Where now we um. We are, we have a small amount compared to the states, and that's understandable. But when, like the COFA nations, uh, citizens are allowed to access Medicaid, and they access Medicaid, say like in Guam, uh, that comes out of the the cap uh, funding. Uh, unlike that, if they use it in Hawaii, for example, they you know they don't have a cap on their Medicaid funding, so it's a problem. Win-win both ways. I mean, you can't refuse this to COFA nations, but it's a decision that governors uh, have the option to, uh, you know, whether allow it or not. And so, uh, yeah, it continues to need work. And so, but uh, anyway, uh, thank you um, for that. Uh, Miss, uh, the ranking member, uh, Miss Gonzalez Colon. Uh, Miss Colon, you have uh, five minutes, please. Thank you, Chairman. I echo, and I want to say, first of all, thank you to the governors uh, that uh, we witnessed today, and I echo many of the things that uh, Governor of Virgin Island just said. I mean, in the case of Puerto Rico, it was somebody who actually moved from New York to Puerto Rico who lose those benefits in, in the case of Vallejo, and I was part of the, um, you know, friend of the court in that case, so but we totally support that, and that's the reason we, we filed a few years ago, H.R. 537, that will seek that uh, SSI for the territories. Having said that, in, in, in for the oversight hearing we, we are having here today, I just wanna make a question to Mr. Dunn. Uh, first of all, welcome. I know this is your first time uh, in front of the committee. Uh, in 2003, when economic assistance package was extended, the compact of fee association partners agreed to set up uh, compact trust funds with the U.S. as the lead donor. Um, in 2019, the General Accounting Office issued two reports concluding that the trust funds have not reached a self-sustaining -sustain, level of growth that will enable the U.S. and freely associated states to continue the success of the compact without continued federal programs and economic assistance grants. Um, my question will be now, how many members of your office, uh, Insular Affairs staff in 2022 or in 2023 will have duties and spend time working on, on the tasks and activities related uh, to the Compact Trust funds? Well, the number of staff that we have working on Compact Trust funds, uh, we probably have a handful that work uh, with the commit trust fund committees and executing and so their could duties. Could be five, could be three, could be two. Yeah, on a regular basis. Of course, we're, a lot of us are on the periphery, but uh, I'd say there's probably five core. Uh, certainly uh, the director of the Office of Insular Affairs, uh, uh, Nick Pula, uh, chairs the trust fund. So, so in 2022, we'll be five, and 2023, 
the five as well? Yeah, it, it won't change, yeah. Okay. And um, how many insular affairs officials are members of the trust funds committee, if any? Well, the, the chairman the committee is the director of the Office of Insular Affairs. Uh, he is the official member from the Department of Interior. So one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to make questions to Mr. Um, um, Sobolik. Sorry. Um, I know the administration has significantly increased its climate in green energy programs um, in the Office of Insular Affairs in the fiscal year 2023 budget request. Um, do you think, I mean, reading your statement uh, and, and the impact of the Republic of China um, in the region, do you think this increase is, is a good way to counter uh, China's influence in, in the Pacific? Thank you for that question, Ranking Member. I think there are two different levels to examine that question at, at a high 30,000 foot level and then down in the details. At a high level, the Biden administration seems to believe with Build Back Better World that climate change is one of the best ways they can counter the Belt and Road Initiative that China is pushing. Infrastructure for infra infrastructure, except on the US side, they're pushing green energy. I am skeptical in a strategic sense that climate change is going to be a good answer to what China is doing around the world with their infrastructure investments. If you look at Latin America with Brazil, it's coming to a head where China is helping Brazil deforest the Amazon and the Biden administration is trying to convince them not to do so. Uh, and China's uh, offer is gonna be more attractive to the government there than ours is. If you get down into the weeds though, uh, for, for these Pacific Island nations, a lot of them are, are great candidates for an all of the above approach to energy. Uh, but to get, I think, to the heart of what you're asking, when I was listening to the governors give their uh, talk about what life is like and what the assistance they need, a lot of it had to do with health infrastructure. A lot of it had to do with infrastructure of different kinds, too, uh, and digital infrastructure, which is what the Belt and Road exactly is. And if we just focus on climate change and miss those other equally important realities, I think we're going to miss what countering China actually looks like. Thank you. If you can submit for the record a list of other strategies uh, or efforts that the insular affairs should be prioritizing in conjunction with the Department of Defense or the Department of State, that could be good for the committee. Thank you, and uh, I yield back. And thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Gonzalez Colon. Um, I'm going to go to my questions. Um, uh, Mr. Don, um, uh, Congress has been steadily increasing funding for the Energizing Insular Communities Program the last several years, and I, I applaud the President for, again, for requesting $15 million for the program. It does not seem, however, that OIA has been using this money as effectively as it could and not as intended in Public Law 113-235. The law enacted in 2014 mandated Interior create energy action plans for all the insular areas developed by teams of technical, policy, and financial experts. These plans were required to provide recommendations on ways to reduce reliance and expenditures on imported fuel, develop and utilize domestic energy sources, and establish benchmarks for measuring progress. Besides awarding annual grants that, you know, a solar system here, you know, lighting fixtures here and those things, how has OIA used funding for the energizing uh, insular communities program to meet the requirements of the law, of public law 113-235? Well, we have provided grants to the territories to update their existing energy plans. Uh, we expected that when those energy plans were developed and released in 2013 that they would be dynamic. Uh, we're hopeful that the money that we provided beginning in 2019 through about through 2021 uh, will help push uh, the effort along and certainly we still work closely with the Department of Energy uh, in providing advice to the territories 
as they update their plans. Yeah, no, no, Mr. Don. I mean, that's 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 great. But I'm saying there is a law that requires the development of a comprehensive energy plan for the different insular areas. So you could, we could develop one for Guam that would be different for one from American Samoa or the Virgin Islands. That's that's law, and we're not doing that. And so, and this is not the first time I've brought this up. And uh, do you know? Um, and which is, you know, why I was hoping a, on a political point they would join us. Do you do you know when Interior intends to comply with public this public law that that's well, we certainly intend to apply comply with the public law. Uh, after this hearing, what we can do is follow up with the uh, each of the territories uh, on the status of. Uh, updating their plans with the consultants hired with the funds we provided uh, through the Energizing Insular Communities Program and try to get an idea of when, uh, where they're at and updating their plans and when they may be released and provide that to you. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if it was, I think it was Interior was supposed to provide that, develop the plan in, in cooperation and collaboration with the each of the insular area ju uh, jurisdictions. And, uh, you know, again, it's a good place to start to read the law and, and see where it could be uh, more helpful, uh, Mr. Don. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and can you also bring back to send back, uh, provide Congress with, with you know, in data information that tells, tells us how the different, the monies were spent consistent with the public law rather than just you know, issuing money as if there were technical assistance uh, program grants. Um, the, since, you see, Mr. Don, the law requires that annual reports be submitted to Congress detailing progress on implementation of each approved energy action plan. And like you have men mentioned, and all I have seen are list of awarded program grants. Uh, and so does OIF find this style of reporting to Congress to follow the law without the need to provide information on insular energy usage? Well, the scope of our energy program is pretty much our energizing insular communities program that we uh, describe in the president's budget request and provide updates there. But uh, certainly we can uh, circle back and figure out uh, additional information that the, the committee might want uh, submitted. Okay. So, and, you know, hopefully we come to some kind of understanding on, on this so we don't have to, you know, this is not the first time we brought this up. I appreciate that. Uh, and I will have uh, other questions that I uh, that I will um, ask, uh, submit for the record, Mr. Don. I do have a question here for, let me see, um, Governor Bryant, now let me ask, um, uh, the, the Virgin Islands Romex has tax. For 2020, the actual was 277 million. Then in 2021, it went to 224 million, and now it's expected to be 261 million. I thought during the during the pandemic, people were home and they drank more rum, uh, right? You would think well, me, you, would, you would think right. You in the Virgin Islands, we refer to, to all liquor as rum, Scotch whiskey everything else, but I think we're seeing an increase in tequila drinking, especially during the pandemic. And oh, rum is okay. not so much. So, you know, we, we don't get, I wish we got uh, uh, the excise tax on everything, but we don't get it on certain things. So thank you for asking, but yes, uh, okay. that's, that's what you're saying. Um, that listen, um, I have uh, um, questions that I'd like to submit for the record and I get them some of our witnesses to respond to them, and other members may also have questions. Uh, my time is up. Um, so, I, uh, is Ms. Radiwagon uh, in the room? Can, hello? Uh, I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Ms. Radiwagon. Yeah, I'm, Ms. Radiwagon, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank Please. you, Vice Chair Sablan, Ranking Member Gonzalez Colon, for holding this hearing today. Talo Falaba, and welcome to the governors and members of the panel. I would especially like to recognize my governor, High Chief Lemanu 
Palipoi Shialinga Maunga for his dedication and hard work for the people of American Samoa. Thank you for taking the time and waking up early to provide your testimony today. Welcome, Governor Bryan, and special offer day to my good friend, Governor Lulian Guerrero of Guam. Climate change continues to be an existential threat to the territories. Rising sea levels threaten to completely cover some islands in the near future. Every small Pacific Island country says that climate change is their biggest national security concern. And to that end, I appreciate OIA's efforts to advance the energy independence of the insular areas. As I've stated to this committee many times, there's no one size fits all solution to the territory's energy needs. And I encourage OIA to continue working with our governor and local officials to ensure that any funding provided is used effectively and helps us move away from a reliance on expensive imported oil and gas. Beyond just reducing emissions, it's important to recognize that this is not only an environmental concern for our territories, but also a political and economic issue. Inflation disproportionately affects remote areas like the territories. If we do not invest in the Pacific and ensure that our territories become self-sufficient, then simply someone else will. As Governor Monga just said, China continues to make bold investments in the region. China is increasingly making their presence felt. In neighboring Samoa, they've invested in building a dual-use airport less than 80 miles from American Samoa. I want to shift over to my other main concern, and that is health care access in American Samoa. COVID-19 has highlighted another funding issue faced by our home and health care infrastructure. Last year, we were able to secure $2.5 million for our operations account to be used towards planning a replacement for LBJ Hospital. However, as highlighted in Governor Limanu's te testimony, continued funding, funding for this account to offset inflation and OIA's continued involvement in this project is crucial to our island's well-being. To conclude, robust funding and oversight of OIA programs is one of our best tools to maintain our presence in the Pacific and push back against the threats to the region. I look forward to working with everyone here to that end. My question here is for Mr. Dunn. I was glad to hear Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Lambert and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Interior Nakoa confirm in recent Senate testimony that the current administration will consider any matters raised by the RMI in response to questions from members of the Senate concerning RMI proposals for additional assistance related to the nuclear testing program consistent with the settlement of legal claims under Section 177. We also hear reports that Special Presidential Envoy Joseph Yun has hit the ground running and has instilled a new confidence that agreement that not just extends but improves free association with Palau, RMI, and FSM. So here's my question, Mr. Dunn. Has the Biden-Harris administration on policy matters taken the position that because of the 1986 legal se settlement, the Section 177 agreement now somehow prevents the U.S. and RMI from mutual agreement on additional measures related to the nuclear testing legacy, including extension of Section 177 agreement assistance that would have expired in 2003 if not extended by the U.S. and accepted by the Republic of the Marshall Islands? Mr. Dunn. I don't have a, a response on specific provisions. However, I will say that Ambassador Yoon uh, has expressed that he is ready and able to discuss with the freely associated states anything they may want to discuss. And we know that uh, the President Kabua of the Marshall Islands has raised the issue of nuclear legacy, and I'm sure it'll be part of the discussions. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. My time is up, but I will look forward to written response to these questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time, which is zero. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Radewagon. And now I, uh, let me recognize Mr. Soto. Mr. Soto, you have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman, for hosting this hearing. We know that with the infrastructure law, there was a historic moment, <clears throat> much like with the American Rescue Plan. Territories were treated equally, finally, in these major packages, uh, whether it's my family's native island of Puerto Rico or so many other uh, amazing territories, the leaders of which we have here today. I do want to make sure that the Office of Insular Affairs is ready to help our territories with bringing down the full might of this funding to help improve infrastructure across all these amazing islands. Uh, so, Mr. Dunn, can you please walk me through in your budget request for insular affairs, any technical assistance or other ways that the office will be able to assist uh, our territories to apply for infrastructure grants and, and other ways to, to take advantage of these uh, two amazing pieces of legislation? Certainly, the bipartisan infrastructure law has a lot of money available out there, and we want to make sure that uh, our territories have an equal shake in, in their applications and getting access to that funding. To that end, uh, last month we hosted a workshop uh, where we in tried work to pair uh, federal program managers that uh, were receiving money under the bill with uh, the territories and potential recipients out there so that they have the best chance possible to succeed. Uh, in uh, accessing uh, their fair share of the funding. And what projects so far, what has been the biggest demand for infrastructure among uh, our, our U.S. territory? Um, with regards to usage of uh, uh, Bill Act money, I'm seeing a lot of water-related health projects, uh, but that certainly go goes far beyond that. <laughs> There's needs across the board and the pots of money available under the bill uh, range quite widely. Uh, there's ecosystems money available through our own Department of Interior that we're working to make sure that they also have a bite at that apple. Governor Bryan, thank you for being here. Uh, obviously in Florida, we have a close relationship with the Virgin Islands and appreciate having many uh, folks uh, going back and forth between the Virgin Islands and, and the Sunshine State. I, can, I saw that, see that quite often. Uh, we stand with you all and uh, would love to hear some of the infrastructure needs of the Virgin Islands. Um, we, thank you, uh, and we have been, uh, we, have a, we do have a close relationship with Florida, entire Caribbean. And I'd like to thank the great state of Florida for offering Caribbean students that uh, in-state tuition. Uh, and and we, we get so much supplies from there. Our real concern now are roads. We're doing a lot of uh, road repair right now with our ARPA funds. We're able to do that budget support. So that has been very helpful. But we have so much infrastructure that have not been attended to, to in like 40 years. Uh, one of the things that we're looking for is is also for our, our HUD funds that we have, our CDBG funds that we were awarded for the hurricanes. Uh, we've been greatly delayed by the two years of the pandemic, so we just, we're going to be seeking some extensions there and would love um, the committee's support. But other than that, I'm saying we're, we're doing real well otherwise, and thank you, Florida, for sending all those nice cruise passengers our way. Thank you so much, Governor, and I yield back. Yeah, so Darren, you're done? You're, you're back? I'm sorry, I'm in this hearing and two markup. Mr. Soto. Yes, I, I yield back, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't, haven't seen any member wishes to ask questions that I have not recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you got Mr. Obernotti here in the uh, the. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, Mr. Obernotti, um, sir, um, you're, Recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Uh, I have a couple questions for Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn, welcome to the committee. Uh, we heard some pretty compelling testimony from Mr. Sabolik and also from the vice chair 
and the ranking member concerning the compacts of free association with the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau, and the importance that that might have for United States national security. And in your own written testimony, you made mention of the fact that the administration remains committed to the renewal of those agreements. Could you give us an update on the status of those negotiations and the timetable for renewing? Well, the economic assistance provisions under those agreements expire at the end of 2023. So the goal is to get something to the Congress for its consideration before then. <laughs> but I would say that Ambassador Yoon, the President's special presidential envoy for the compact negotiations, has given a spark uh, to the process and that we're well engaged with all three of the freely associated states now and have plans to meet and, and to move things forward. I think everybody is looking to have a uh, come to agreement uh, in a timely manner uh, and in a way that's uh, mutually beneficial in our nation to nation relationships. Thank you. Uh, well, I have my voice to the other voices that you've heard today uh, in opining the importance of getting those agreements renewed, uh, not just for the benefit of, uh, of uh, those countries, but also for the benefit of our own national security. Um, talking about the OIA's budget request, the largest uh, budget increase in the request was for the renewable energy projects, and I know we've had a couple of questions about that already. Uh, my question is this, the, uh, th this, this budget increase is uh, specifically targeted at renewable energy, which I think many of us on the committee support. Uh, I'm a supporter of renewable energy, but uh, also, we recognize that renewable energy projects come with their own set of problems and challenges. And in particular, in my own state of California, you can see some of the problems that have been caused by a, uh, a premature shift to renewable energy at the expense of other forms of energy generation because it comes at the cost of grid reliability. So uh, when we're talking about parts of the world where grid reliability is already a problem, uh, why focus on just these projects instead of some of the other things that have brought up, been brought up? For example, upgrading some of the existing power plants to use uh, liquefied natural gas, for example, which would be not only more cost effective, but also enhance grid reliability, uh, reliability more than the projects that you're focusing on. I think the answer to that question is that we do focus on a traditional generation. Uh, the insular areas require fuel for their base load capacity. Uh, whether it be diesel, I think the uh, Virgin Islands using liquid uh, pro propane now, uh, but certainly that's not going away anytime soon. Uh, and so it is, you do have to be thoughtful about how you apply renewables into the grid. Uh, that's where our relationships with uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab and with Energy, we uh, to work as consultants alongside with the consultants that are already there with the utilities to make sure things uh, go smoothly. And we have invested in uh, things beyond solar panels. You know, we've invested in uh, things that improve uh, the efficiency of the generation and distribution systems, uh, whether it be automation and things like that, uh, in addition to solar panels and battery uh, storage that provide a level of resilience to a facility like a hospital in case of a disruption in power outage and that type of thing. So we're, we try to be thoughtful in how we apply uh, the funds under the Energizing the Insular Community programs, but it's not fully limited just to like solar panels. Yeah. Sure. Well, and I didn't imply that it was. I'm yeah. just uh, I'm just concerned because we want to get the territories up to a level of maximum grid reliability as soon as we possibly can, and I want to make sure we're exploring all the avenues to do that. So, uh, as a follow-on question, let me ask you this: We talk a lot in this committee about territorial self-determination. Why not just take this money, give it to the territories for the purpose of improving grid reliability and let them decide what the best use for those funding would be? Most of the, the budget from the Office of Insular Affairs, we have a close relationship with the territories and their leadership. Uh, certainly, the, this is an application-based program, and the governors have a chance to chop off on the applications from their territories. and. Uh, can have a chance to say what their priorities are, uh, and we certainly take uh, recommendations from members of this committee too for certain projects, and that gives that we give them extra weight. Uh, so certainly, 
we do not make investments on our own. These are grants that we award to these territories. Uh, they apply for them and, and we award them. It should represent their requirements and their needs. Okay, well, I, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to join the, the chorus of voices in saying that I think what the territories want the most is uh, cost-effective, reliable, reliable mm -hmm. energy generation. And uh, I think renewables have a place in that, but so do transition fuels like liquefied natural gas, natural gas, and I hope that the administration keeps that in mind. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You'll back. Thank you, Mr. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I'm Ms. Porter. Um, Ms. Kitty, uh, you are next. You have five minutes. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I want to start by just associating myself with uh, Ms. Radwagon's questions, and I am really consistently encouraged by the degree of, by, by this committee's bipartisan approach to the U.S. nuclear legacy, and want to thank Ms. Radwagon for her leadership in particular on this. As we all know here, um, but as I keep reminding the American people, from 1946 to 1958, the U.S. conducted 67 nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands, and radioactive waste from these tests is stored at Runet Dome, which is a leaking con concrete containment structure. Mr. Dunn, your office funds the Department of Energy to do environmental analysis of the groundwater at Runet Dome, and they have been required by law to give Congress a report every four years starting in 2012. This is the year 2022. Have they finished the initial report to Congress? Not that I'm aware of, no. No, the answer is no. Yeah. Have they, and by they here we mean the Department of Energy. Right. Has the Department of Energy given you a cost estimate for what environmental monitoring will take because you have to fund it? Uh, to date, we've provided them with $2.1 million, and there's $1.2 million remaining in there. Great. So I'm, I'm going to go there next. So I know that you've given them money and that you have money remaining, but have they given you? We're here to try to figure out what you need. Have they told you, has Department of Energy told you what money they need to do the required environmental monitoring to clean up our nuclear mess? I haven't engaged personally on with them on how much it would cost, and uh, I, I would like it would probably need to be updated from whatever they had requested previously. Uh, and certainly we would look at their request and uh, provide any funding as appropriate as required by law. Will you ask the Department of Energy to tell you what they need to do the job that Congress has mandated them to do? Yes, we will. We'll ask. And if they don't respond, let me know because I want to be helpful. Um, you mentioned that you've given DOE 2.1 million and that there's about 1.2 million remaining. Um, when I held a hearing in the oversight subcommittee of this committee, Department of Energy told us that, quote, this is one of their, quote, highest priorities because we have people working on this all the time. When was the last time these people working on it all the time at DOE gave you an update on Runet Dome? I haven't received an update from them. I don't know that they would, but uh, I'm not sure what, what they're doing right now. I would say that the travel restrictions for groundwater monitoring uh, would be very difficult uh, simply because of the COVID travel restrictions. Yes, there are definitely travel restrictions in place. So let me ask you this, um, because those travel restrictions are, are a challenge. Has DOE asked you for your help has DOE asked, has Energy asked Interior for its help in getting an exception to the travel ban so they can get out there and, and do this groundwater, contain, um, groundwater monitoring? Not that I'm aware of. Will you commit to this committee to working, to pushing if necessary, the Department of Energy and working with the Marshallese people to make that happen? Certainly we would work with the committee and the Department of Energy and any other interagency parties we need to be able to fulfill the law. I mean, your office is the source of funds for this program. So it is incumbent on your office, the Office of Insular Affairs, to conduct oversight of how money is being spent, but also whether money is being spent for the purpose it was intended. So while DOE is the party here that is not doing the work, your office is the entity responsible for making sure that work is getting done. 
Um, I want to turn with my remaining time to the Supplemental Education Grant Program. It's called SEG. Um, and your office administers that program with funding from the Department of Education. When was the last time the Supplemental Education Grant Program, when was the last time it was fully funded? It, it hasn't been fully funded uh, to the level that uh, authorized to date. So the last time it was fully funded, according to my research, is 2010, 12 years ago. They are supposed to be getting $6.1 million in 2004 dollars adjusted for inflation. Um, and full funding is going to happen this year and be around 8.1 million. What are those grants used for? Those grants underwrite uh, early education programs in the Marshall Islands and Federated States of Micronesia, including some nutri nutritional assistance. Okay, so we're not fully funding a program that children depend on for food. It's really hard to overstate the importance of that funding in a country like the Marshall Islands where one third of children have stunted growth from malnutrition. We just finished talking about the nuclear legacy, the US nuclear legacy in the Marshall Islands and how the United States isn't owning up to its promises on that issue. I would like to enter into the record this story from last November about the potential for China to take advantage of the United States failings here. I am really heartened that Ambassador Joseph Yoon has been appointed as the Special Presidential Envoy for Compact Negotiations, and I think that is a positive step. But ultimately, we have to keep our commitments with things like school lunches, with help with climate change, with addressing that U.S. nuclear legacy. Those things, our commitment to keeping our promises, are going to make the difference between whether China or the United States has influence Thank in the you. insular areas. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Porter. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm a supporter of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, uh, really great advocate. Um, now I recognize Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Chair. Sir, you have, you have five minutes. Rep. Gonzalez Conwell. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Sobolik, you noted that the GAO argued in 2002 that Micronesia and the Marshall Islands served and a quote, no role in U.S. strategy in the Asia-Pacific region. Today, we know this is far from accurate, given the presence of crucial DOD equities in these locations. We could almost look back 20 years and say maybe that's why so much, um, maybe we're playing so much catch-up now and why there is real struggles of, of um, you know, in the South China Sea and areas like that. So uh, I think you correctly stated that, and I and calling that out is nice. Um, as we look forward to future threats, what current assessments do you think we need to carefully reconsider so we don't get caught flat-footed or, I would argue, more flat-footed than we already are? Uh, Congressman, I think, I think that is the right question to be asking. And I think we need to jettison the posture and the assumption that we are uncontested in our relationships with US territories and with freely associated states and more broadly, that our presence in the Pacific Ocean is guaranteed because it's not, it's absolutely not. And you're right to link this to what's happening in the South China Sea because ultimately from a strategic and a military planning perspective, these Pacific Island nations matter for the national interest of the United States and for the American people because they are what allow the US Navy, the Air Force, the Army, and the Marines to forward deploy with relative ease and keep logistics lines running from the west coast of the United States all the way to Japan, to the Philippines, uh, to Guam, Hawaii, and elsewhere. Uh, these relationships uh, with the freely associated states in particular are crucial. They not only help us forward deploy, they also deny China's military acts free and open and unmitigated access to the region. But for all the reasons you mentioned just now, sir, uh, I think we're realizing that we have been assuming that this is a guarantee for us. And I, I think the, the discussion that we've had with other members with the Marshall Islands and nuclear waste and others with how we're falling down on our own obligations and with the Solomons recently in the South Pacific uh, we've, we have been caught in flat-footed. I think we need to jettison all those assumptions that we are guaranteed in our presence. Let's, um, continuing on with that, I appreciate you highlighting the freely associated states. Uh, I agree. And I serve on Armed Services Committee, and we members of that 
members of the committee and I share the concern and your concern of China expansionist behavior. Um, the, we can look at that you know, across the globe, but in particular, if we keep it in that region. You're advising the Biden administration. What are some of the key things that you suggest and you would advise the Biden administration to do to further expedite the renewal of the compacts of free association? Yes, uh, the main sticking point with the marshals in particular uh, which uh, Representative Porter was just talking about is the issue of nuclear waste. Uh, and uh, the big hang up there until recently has been the Biden administration believing that all claims in the situation were settled in the 80s uh, under the Reagan administration. I think it's important for the Biden administration to actually review the terms of the agreement that we negotiated with them even though the claims are settled, specifically under Titles 10 and 12 under that agreement, Title 13 opens the door uh, to continued cooperation on both sides on continuing matters, and you don't reopen the legal claims at all by doing so. So we are not endangering our own position and their relationship at all by helping them. And I think we have a moral obligation as well for all the reasons we've discussed previously. And uh, this is the reality, I think, when it comes to our foreign policy with China, a lot of these important issues that we could get hung up on have nothing really to do with foreign policy. This is nuclear waste. This has to do with something that happened way back in the 40s and the 50s. But it's a part of, it's a referendum on our trustworthiness as a partner. And in that, in that case, it is absolutely related. So I, I think that issue is going to be a bellwether for how this stuff goes. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, did I miss anybody? Is there? I uh, I think we've got everyone covered. Uh, if I got it correctly, if I got it correctly, okay. So um, again, I want to thank uh, the witnesses for their valuable testimony, and of course, the members, my colleagues, for their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses and we will ask you to respond to this in writing. Under committee rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there being no further question without objection, uh, the committee now stands adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>